Our passage today will be from Mark chapter 5, verse 1 to 20. Mark chapter 5, verse 1 to 20. And I will be reading the entire passage. Hear now the word of the Lord. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For, God, for Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and told about the pigs as well. And the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. This is one of those passages in Scripture that can make you feel a little uneasy on your first read. You see a man who is demon-possessed, who hangs out in cemeteries all the time, who cuts himself, You read about 2,000 pigs rushing into a lake and drowning themselves. It's pretty pretty terrifying when you think about it. But if this demon-possessed man and these 2,000 pigs were the only things spoken about in our passage, we might feel a little spooked out after reading it. But by the goodness of God, there is another character in this passage um, who is actually the main focus of the passage, and that character is, of course, Jesus, the Son of God. He is the one whom God wants us to focus on. He is the one whom God wants us to admire and marvel at. And he is the one whose glory, power, and majesty we will get a better glimpse of this morning. So this passage takes place right after Jesus has calmed the storm in the Sea of Galilee. So this is still the early part of his ministry, probably the first year. He and his disciples have landed in a region called the Gadara on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. And the moment Jesus has set foot on this region, a man who is, who is possessed by demons runs right up to him. And how he is described in our chapter is quite disturbing. We are told that he lived in cemeteries. He lived among the tombs. He was around dead people all the time. He was also very physically powerful. Verse 3 tells us that the men in the town tried, um, could not restrain him or bind him. They had formerly managed to shackle his arms with chains, but this man was strong enough to break them with his bare arms, which is pretty crazy. This shows us that demons, which are just evil angels, are extremely powerful. If they possess a man, they can grant him incredible superhuman strength. And this makes sense because God originally created angels with an intelligence and knowledge that is far um, superior to the knowledge and intelligence of humans. So when these angels sinned against God and fell, they retained that intelligence and power. Moreover, this man would cry out day and night, either in the tombs 
or um, in the mountains. It's clear that he didn't sleep much. And the worst part is that he would cut himself with stones. He would engage in self-mutilation, which is pretty gruesome. So the demons in this passage subjected this man to extreme torments, and they caused him to be out of control. Imagine living in this man's town. Um, At nighttime, when you're trying to fall asleep, you hear terrifying cries in the nearby cemetery. When you walk in the street, this man could just pop up out of nowhere, and he could harass you, maybe even attack you. So everyone in the town would have feared this man and avoided him at all costs. But then Jesus visits this town, and then immediately something interesting happens to this demon-possessed man. Verse 6 says, When he, the demon-possessed man, saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. So what exactly happened here? Did these demons just voluntarily run to Jesus and worship him immediately? Not at all. What actually happened was that Jesus' spiritual authority was so great and so powerful that these demons were compelled to run to him and to worship him immediately. There was nothing voluntary about the demons' actions. These demons, who had the power to control this poor man however they wanted, are now forced to appear before Jesus because of his absolute authority over them. And this was clear proof that Jesus was God, for only God could compel powerful demons to worship him. So we see here how powerful Jesus is. Satan and all his minions are totally subject to his authority. They can't do a single thing that is contrary to his will. They can't do a single thing without his permission. This passage refutes the popular idea that Satan is free, absolutely free, to do whatever he wants in this world. He is definitely not free. He is under the absolute authority of God, of Christ, and he can only do things that are in line with God's sovereign will. And then the demons say in verse 7, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. The statement, what have I to do with you, is just another way of saying, what business do you have with me? Or, this matter doesn't concern you, so leave me alone. So these demons clearly didn't want Jesus interfering with their activities. So they indirectly tell him to go away. But the problem is that they don't have the power to make him go away. They can possess and control this poor man however they want. But against Jesus, they're totally, totally powerless which again demonstrates the incredible power of Christ. And they are forced to call him son of the most high God. This is significant because it shows us that these demons had a better idea of who Jesus really was than his disciples and the people in Israel did. Jesus, during this early part of the ministry, didn't just come out and say, hey everyone, look at me, I'm the son of God. He would reveal that information more clearly later in his ministry. So prior to this chapter, everyone in Israel saw Jesus as a human prophet that was sent from God. And the disciples were no different. They saw him the same way. They saw him just as a human prophet. But these demons knew immediately who Jesus really was. They knew that he wasn't just a prophet, but that he was the son of the Most High God, who had the power of casting them straight into eternal hell at any moment. That's why the demons say to Jesus, do not torment us. We see that they're utterly terrified of him. And we see that these demons were able to see spiritual realities more clearly than humans could. And then Christ asked for this demon's name. And the demon answers in verse 9. My name is Legion, for we are many. The name itself is quite fascinating. The word legion is a word used by Romans to refer to the largest unit in the Roman army, which is roughly the, uh, a unit of roughly 5,000 Roman soldiers. So this man was not only demon-possessed, but he was possessed by many, many demons, possibly thousands. And this army of demons was tearing his soul apart from the inside and inflicting extreme torment. Also, when the Jews heard the word legion, it reminded them that they were occupied, that their nation was occupied by Romans. When they thought about Romans, they thought about Gentiles. And when they thought about Gentiles, they thought about ritual uncleanness. Gentiles were ritually unclean, according to the law of Moses. So this man was in many ways the embodiment of ritual uncleanness. We are told that in verse 2 that he had an unclean spirit. He was always around dead bodies, which are ritually unclean, according to Mosaic law. His name was Legion, which reminded the Jews of Roman Gentile uncleanness. 
Moreover, our text tells us that there was a, um, a huge pig farm nearby that contained 2,000 pigs. That's a lot of pigs. You can create a lot of bacon and sausage with that. And that large number of pigs provides a big clue about the ethnicity of this region. Remember, Jews weren't allowed to eat pigs. They were unclean animals, according to Mosaic law. So the presence of these many pigs could only mean that the people in this region, including this demon-possessed man, were all Gentiles, non-Jews. So Jesus is dealing with a man who not only has an unclean spirit, but who's, who is also an unclean Gentile. So you see that there are layers and layers of uncleanness in this man. This is a man that any regular Jew would have shunned at all costs. And Jesus was a Jew, so he had every reason to avoid this man. But in spite of all these layers of uncleanness, Jesus chooses to interact with this man and help him. He does something that no other Jew would have done, which shows us his grace and kindness. He then commands the demons to get out of the man. They respond by begging him to let them enter into the herd of pigs. And Jesus allows them to do that. Verse 13 says, Jesus gave them permission. Which again proves that Jesus was God, that he had absolute authority over them, and that they couldn't do a single thing without his permission. Then the crazy part happens. The demons leave the man, and then they enter into the pigs. The pigs become demon-possessed, and then they all rush into the lake and drown themselves. It's pretty shocking stuff if you try to visualize it. But while this crazy event is happening, what has happened to the demon-possessed man? Verse 15 tells us that he was sitting and clothed and in his right mind. So you see Jesus standing victoriously like a king after he has conquered a legion of demons. And you see this man who was cutting himself and breaking chains with his arms now sitting and clothed and in his right mind. It's quite a majestic, majestic sight. And then something unexpected happens in the narrative. The farmers who were taking care of the pigs rush, rush off. Um, they see all this, and then they enter into the nearby city and tell everyone what has happened. Then many people from the city come out to see this Jesus. Verse 15 says, Then the people came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Now, at this point, you would expect to see the townspeople rejoice because one of their townsmen has been restored. This mysterious man named Jesus came out of nowhere and did a truly good and wonderful deed. He liberated this man from a legion of demons. He delivered him from extreme torment and suffering. The crazy man who used to make terrifying noises at night, who used to harass everyone, who used to cut himself, is now sitting and clothed and in his right mind. He has been perfectly restored by this kind visitor, and he's no longer a menace to society. So you would think that these townspeople would rejoice and throw a party because this man has been restored. He's no longer demon-possessed. They don't have to see him in torment anymore. And you would think that these people would ask Jesus to stay longer so that they could learn more about him. But what do they do instead? They beg Jesus to get out of the land. They beg him to leave. It's quite a twist in the narrative. So why did these people want Jesus to leave? There were a couple of reasons. First, verse 15 says that they were afraid. They felt fear because this miracle displayed Christ's incredible power. And more importantly, it displayed his incredible holiness. And witnessing divine holiness is going to cause any sinner to become fearful. And that includes us. So that was one reason why the townspeople wanted him to leave. They were afraid. But I don't think that that was the ultimate reason. They were definitely afraid. But in light of the goodness and kindness that Christ displayed, fear would not have been a strong enough reason to tell him to get out. So what ultimately caused them to tell him to get out was the loss of their pigs, which brought about a huge loss of their income and money. 2,000 pigs, if you think about it, that's a lot of money. That's an entire economy um, for this town. And because they lost this money, and because they knew that Jesus was capable of doing something like this again, they tell him to go away. So we, so we see that these people cared more about their money than they did about the well-being of their townsmen, of their neighbor. 
They cared more about their money than they did about learning about Christ and his salvation. And we see the exact same problem today, don't we? We, in our society, most people care more about money and comfort than they do about knowing Christ and being saved from eternal hell. This just shows us how blind and foolish sin has made humans. Moreover, we see why the demons wanted to enter into the pigs in the first place. They wanted to upset the townspeople by tanking their economy, by causing them to lose a lot of their money. And Jesus gave these demons permission to do this so that he could test the people to see whether they would respond properly to his work of saving this man. And it's clear that they failed the test miserably when they showed that they cared more about their money than they did about the grace and salvation that Christ was offering. We can draw a couple of lessons from this. First, this passage refutes a common argument that unbelievers make, who say, I would believe in Christ if only I were given enough physical evidence. The people in this passage had a lot of physical evidence. They saw this man, who used to be demon-possessed, now restored. They saw 2,000 pigs rushing into a lake. They saw 2,000 dead pigs floating in this lake. That's a lot of physical evidence. But how did they respond to that evidence? They totally rejected Christ. In fact, they told him to go away. So this shows us that evidence isn't enough. Even though evidence is a good thing, and we should present it, because there's a lot of historical evidence for Christianity, it isn't enough. Only the Holy Spirit can make a person believe. The reason why an unbeliever doesn't believe is not a lack of evidence. It's because he doesn't want to believe. He doesn't want to believe in Christ. He doesn't want to submit to Christ. He doesn't want to um, renounce his own kingship in this world. He won't submit to the king. So the Holy Spirit is needed for the work of faith and repentance. Secondly, we learn that the advancement of God's kingdom often requires the loss of material goods like our money and property. The kingdom of God was advanced in this town when this man was restored, but it required the loss of income from 2,000 pigs. So the question is, would you be willing to sacrifice money if God called you to it, if it meant that the kingdom of Christ, your savior, would be advanced? We are reminded here that Christ's kingdom needs to be our first priority because he has loved us and saved us from the wrath of God. And if his kingdom requires the loss of our material goods, we should suffer that loss as Christ taught us in the Gospels. So back to our narrative. After Jesus is asked to leave, he and his disciples get back into the boat and they prepare for their journey back west. But as they're about to leave, the man who had been demon-possessed comes to Jesus and begs him to let him become one of his disciples. And that makes sense. The man was extremely grateful. He had been tormented by a legion of demons. This random, mysterious stranger comes and heals him. So now he wants to follow Jesus wherever he goes. He wants to serve him, and he wants to um, help him in his ministry. But Jesus responds in an interesting way. He denies his request. And why did he deny it? Um, The first reason, I think, was because the man was a Gentile. It It would have scandalized the Jews greatly, if one of Jesus' disciples was a Gentile. It wasn't time yet to do something this culturally radical. That time would come in the book of Acts, where we see Paul working alongside Gentiles in his ministry. But now was not the right time. The second reason was because Jesus wanted this man to stay in his hometown so that he could spread the news about him to his fellow townsmen. Verse 19 says, Jesus says in verse 19, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he he has had compassion on you. Jesus knew that this man would be far more useful for his mission if he stayed at home and spread the news, the good news about Christ to his people. And that is exactly what the man did. Verse 20, he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. Now for some final thoughts. When we read this story, we should be reminded that we were like this demon-possessed man in some ways, or at the least, we would be like this man if it were not for the grace of God. None of us here probably has ever been demon-possessed, but the reality is that if God had not intervened in our lives, we would have been total slaves of the devil. 
We would have lived lives that were completely dominated by the devil and our own sin. Just as the demons turned this man into a madman, our sin and the devil would have caused us to become spiritually mad. We would have engaged in spiritually destructive acts like ignoring God, ignoring Christ, ignoring the gospel for the rest of our lives, and then go to hell as a result. And there is no greater spiritual madness than living a life which you know will guarantee hell at the end of it. But Christ, as king, subdued our wicked, unbelieving natures by his grace, just as he subdued the demons in our passage. And by his Holy Spirit, he has enlightened our spiritual eyes and has given us the gift of faith. He caused us to repent, and he caused us to believe in the gospel, and he has graciously set us free from the dominion of our sin and the devil. And we should praise Christ for that. We also learned in this passage that Jesus graciously entered a region that was filled with uncleanness. There was a man who had an unclean spirit, who lived among unclean tombs, who was an unclean Gentile. There were farms filled with unclean animals. In some ways, this was a small picture of Jesus entering into an unclean world in order to save unclean sinners like you and me. This world was an unclean, evil, stinking place which no person in heaven would have ever wanted to enter into. None of the holy angels would have wanted to set foot in this unclean world. But Christ, out of his love for sinners like us, broke into our world in order to save us. The Holy Son of God came into an unclean world like this to deliver us from the tyranny of sin and the devil. So if you are not believing in Christ today, believe in this Christ who is king, who alone can set you free from the devil and the sin that enslaves you. So congregation, in light of what Christ has done for us in setting us free from the devil and our sin, let us be grateful to him. Let our hearts be filled with gratitude and love for him. And let us also be witnesses of Christ to those around us, just as this demon-possessed man was to his townspeople. And let us tell people about the great things God has done for us in Christ. Let us tell people how he has had compassion on us. And let us tell people how he has saved us, how God has saved us by the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Let us spread this good news, which alone can deliver people from sin and the devil. May Christ our King be praised. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this passage in which we see Christ as our king, in which we see him displaying his um, kingly authority and power over demons and over sin. Lord, we give you thanks for Christ who um, entered into this unclean world. He took upon himself our own, our own uncleanness and removed it completely out of your sight. Uh, we're grateful, Lord, for what he has done for us. And help us, Lord, to remember um, what we were Um, or what we would have been without your grace intervening in our lives, without your grace causing us to believe in Christ. Um, Help us to remember how spiritually mad we would have been, how spiritually insane we would have been and blind um, without your mercy and grace um, penetrating into our hearts. So Lord God, may you help us to lay these words in our heart this week. Help us to um, have hope in Christ. Help us to have joy um, from this passage and from knowing that Christ is the king who has subdued our enemies, who has drawn us to himself by his um, infinite power, and who has promised us a a kingdom, a heavenly kingdom um, in the life to come. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.